We have looked these past weeks at peace in an age of anxiety, forgiveness in an age of revenge, and today contentment in an age of dissatisfaction. There's a well-known American preacher who came to Sydney maybe 15 years ago now and reflected on what is it in Australia's culture that is their idol. I wonder what you thought he came up with as, a, as an outside observer. He reckoned it was comfort, comfort, that everything we do is to try and make ourselves just that little bit more comfortable. We might shift house so that we might be a little bit more comfortable. We might dress for comfort. Uh, we might want a little bit more money so that we'll be that little more comfortable. We might dress in a particular way when we're going to meet friends so that we might fit in and be a little bit more comfortable. Comfort. Comfort. I wonder if you can relate to that. I wonder if you think Australians are on the whole looking for comfort and that in many ways that's what you're doing too. I do think that Australians, on the whole, lack contentment. And they're looking for it in all sorts of places, whether that be a career or a new property or a sporting goal like doing a marathon, a triathlon, or trying to win lotto, or whatever it takes, or maybe meditation or Eastern religions or reading philosophy, anything, just to find some, some answers, to find where they fit, to find some purpose, to find some peace, to find some answers along the way to the confusion and the hurt, the pain that they've experienced. But do you know what? People are not finding contentment. Contrast this with the words of the Apostle Paul, who says, We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. <laughs> and we want to say to Paul, Will we? You reckon? If only we were. We want to say back to Paul, if only that, but we're not feeling it. Most Australians have way more than we ever need. We have food and clothing, yet we're not content. He went on to say in Philippians 4.12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And we say, well, good on you, good on you, Paul. I'm glad you've learned that. What is the secret? That's what we want to know. That's what we want to discover. What is it? So I want to talk to you today about the trap of wanting more and the joy of knowing Jesus. The trap of wanting more and the joy of knowing Jesus. The trap of knowing, wanting more. Among the many options in Lotto this week was one that was going to jackpot to $70 million. The last time that happened, about half of Australians, it was said, uh, bought a ticket. Uh, that time, uh, despite how many people uh, played, the numbers didn't come up and the amount jackpotted. That just shows you how small the odds are of winning. Yet people are looking for just a little bit more. Next month, the Melbourne Cup will be on. Staggering amounts spent. On, um, on the celebrations of the day and, of course, on uh, putting your money on a horse. Why do people do it? Because they're wanting just that little bit more. Imagine the good that you can do with, for the poor and needy with the amount of money that gets spent on gambling. But people are looking for a little bit more so that they might be content or so they believe. Not a lot more, just just a little bit more. The survey said that no matter how much people, um, how much money people have, they want about 10% more. So the millionaire, they just want about $100,000 more. Then they'll be content. The person who has 40000 just wants 4000 more. Then they reckon they'll be content. Isn't that staggering? Just a little bit more. We can't help it. So people end up on this endless cycle, looking, wanting, working, wanting just that little bit more, which at present is escaping them. Australians are working hard to be content and yet wondering why it slipped through their hands. It's a tragic situation. Not only do people end up on this endless cycle, it is actually also dangerous. 1 Timothy 6 verses 9 to 10, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. 
It's not a harmless pursuit, the pursuit of a little bit more. There's a trap and temptation and there's foolish and harmful things that ruin people along the way. And we all know people with um, stories of how people ended up in trouble. Uh, Think of that con artist recently, Melissa Caddick, and all that's resulted from what she was going after. Four years ago, I officiated a wedding at a man named Dave and his wife. Um, There was a kind of hurry for a wedding because he was about to go to jail. He had worked for one of the top four banks and had worked out a way of siphoning money from their accounts to his account. It was $600,000, not huge in the big scheme of things, but it was enough to send him to jail for two or three years. And he wanted to get married before that happened. Or Susan and I could tell you the story of Bill, his lovely family, beautiful uh, twin girls. He had a gambling problem. He worked for one of the big IT companies, one of the telcos, uh, and yet he wanted just that little bit more, so gambled his money. He ended up losing his marriage, his home, his family, his job. He works now as a handyman, not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's how he gets his money, and yes, he's still gambling. That's tragic, isn't it? You would know many more stories. Wanting more takes its toll. You stay back at work to get ahead. The toll that that takes on marriage and children. Thinking about climbing the corporate ladder. Uh, Thinking that that will lead to contentment, but it doesn't. Some people could have had a job at this level um, so that they could have a little bit more. But this level of job means that they won't see their kids I'm talking about city, city living, of course. They won't see their kids. They won't get time at home during the week. They leave um, before they get up and their f- whole family life is lost. The difference between a job at this level and this level is the toll it takes on, its, on your family. Maybe even on the land. Wanting just that little bit more property to produce that little bit more income. But in the end, what it costs is more than the money that you lay out for the investment. Or people delving into the stock market. Again, nothing wrong with that in itself. But if you make that your goal and your God, then when it crashes, you lose lots. Or people have moved overseas to find contentment. Or plenty of people, when I lived at Noosa, moved to Noosa to find contentment. Oh, if only I can get out into the sun and get away from the gold, or if only I can be on the beach, or if only I can spend time more time playing golf. But do you know what? Contentment escapes them because when they move when they arrive they're still the same person with all the same issues the next day after moving day and they've settled in but they're still them they're still facing all that they are in themselves it was the social commentator Hugh Mackay who observed of baby boomers that often they achieve their life dreams their family has grown up they've got the dream home or the beautiful property Uh, they've done all that they wanted to to do And they put their feet up and they end up asking themselves, is this all there is? That nagging midlife question, is this all there is? They've set out to achieve, they've done all that they set out to achieve, they've done it, they've made it, and now they're asking, well, what is all this about? Is this actually all there is? And they're disappointed in in the end result because they're not satisfied in their heart. Can you relate to that at all? dissatisfied looking for the next answer the toll that has been left in its wake when people go after these things as their end goals it could be their family or the wider set of relationships the toll it takes is enormous well to the question is this all there is I want to say no the answer to is all this is <laughs> is this all there is is a resounding no i'm here to tell you that there is more and it is found in the joy of knowing jesus that is where the more is to be found the apostle paul says i learned to be content whatever the circumstances i've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation And we think, oh, imagine what that must be like. Whatever is your situation, he's learned to be content. How do you do that, Paul? What is the secret, Paul? And he says, the secret is 
relationship, not just any relationship, not just any human relationship, not a relationship like a friend or a spouse, but a relationship with the God who made him and loves him, the God who cares for him and who will never leave him. Paul said, I can do anything through him who gives me strength. When he says anything, he doesn't mean leap tall buildings in a single bound, but he means I can be content no matter what the circumstance. I can be content when I have plenty and when I have nothing. I can do anything because he gives me strength. Can you imagine? When he's lost and lonely, it is God who gives him strength and he finds contentment. When he's hungry and cold and wet, it is God who gives him strength and he can be content. And for us, friends, no matter what your life situation is, whether you're living the high life or you're feeling your life is quite empty, you can be content because God strengthens you. Whether you're looking for an answer to that question on whether there's more to life, you can be content because God strengthens you. Whether you're feeling alone or lost right now, you can be content because God strengthens you. Whether employed or not, content because God strengthens you. Whether we're heading for another round of dry weather and cracked ground and emptying dams, you can be content because God strengthens you. Whether in your family you're estranged from them or away from them uh, geographically or you've lost someone tragically, you can be content because God strengthens you. Whether you're struggling to pay the bills, yet you can be content because God strengthens you. It's all because of relationship with God who is alongside you and is with you. That is where contentment is to be found. Relationship with God. Because you know that you are deeply loved. Because you know He will never leave you. Because you know you are significant to Him. You realize that you matter to Him. Because you realize that there is a plan and a purpose. Because you understand that there is a future promise to you. Resting in those planes, even when you're confused about what is happening in the immediate now. Resting, content in his plans and purposes. Content because of that relationship. Let me tell you about Kath and Adrian. They grew up in another denomination and hardly ever missed church. Uh, they landed on their feet. Kath, uh, Adrian was a successful lawyer, Kath a busy mum, and yet there was a feeling that there was something missing in life. Susan and Kath were friends because they were joint parents at the local primary school. Susan, my wife, asked Kath whether she would like to read the Bible with her. She agreed. After reading the Bible with Susan on and off for some time, she began to come to church and then eventually Adrian followed. They love the fact that when it came to the sermon time, we actually pulled out the Bible. Everyone had one on their lap and we looked at the Bible and sought to see what God was saying to us and then apply it to our lives. They love that. Kath became a Christian. Adrian followed a little later. I remember going to have lunch with him in the city one day and he said to me, Mark, I'm not sure I'm over the line yet. And then about six months later, we met up in the city again for lunch and he said, Mark, I'm over the line. He began to do a part-time theological uh, course. He went and ended up going over to Africa to teach pastors. Uh, Kath became our children's worker at St Andrews Roseville. Uh, Adrian helped run a successful lawyer's fellowship every Thursday morning in the city. They found, in relationship with God, they found the contentment which had eluded them despite their worldly success. They found it in relationship with God. They found it in Jesus. What they hadn't found in church or career or parenthood, they found in Jesus in a real and powerful way that changed their life and gave them contentment. You know, the writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 13, verse 5, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You can be content with what you have because God will always be at your side. No matter what else he has given you, you will always have him because never will I leave you or forsake you. 
Many of us here have been hurt in other relationships because the people have left us or they've been disloyal or they've betrayed our trust. That will never happen with Jesus. He will never leave your side. He will never turn his back on us. That is why we can be content no matter what we have because we'll always have our relationship with the Lord Jesus. Because friends, let me remind you, Christianity is all about relationship. We're not on about religion here. I'm not into religion. I'm not into religion which is devoid of meaning or depth or just plays dress-ups or plies you with rules and regulations and has you go through certain rituals exactly the, the right way. No, no, no. It's not about what we do for God to pass the mark. I'm not into all that at all. That is not what the Christian faith is all about. It's not what the Anglican Church is about. No, what we're on about here is real relationship with God, where you know you're loved, where you know you've been forgiven, where you know you have eternal life, where you know you matter, where you know you matter. A real relationship with God, which of course begins then to mold and shape and transform your life. A real relationship which gives you hope and meaning and purpose and significance. That's what we're on about. And friends, that is where you'll find contentment and nowhere else. So in this series we've been looking at, how can you find peace in an age of anxiety? It's found in relationship with God. As you follow him, as you listen to him, as you heed his voice, as you follow his call, he will show you to green pastures, to still waters. He will be with you in the valley of the shadow of death. His love and mercy will pursue you all the way to eternal life. That is where you'll find peace. How will you find forgiveness in this age of revenge? You'll find it because God freely offers it through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for you. He can offer you forgiveness. No matter what you've done, no matter how far you've strayed, no matter what your history holds, he offers full and free forgiveness. And once you've found forgiveness through him, you are then enabled, empowered, inspired to forgive others. And where will you find contentment in an age of dissatisfaction? In relationship with a God who loves you and will never leave your side and will always be with you and he will strengthen you no matter what your physical immediate circumstances will strengthen you so that you can find contentment in him well friends no matter whether you've been with us for a long time or whether you've just been watching these past three weeks my prayer for you is that increasingly you will find peace forgiveness and contentment in relationship with the God who made you, with the God who loves you, with the God who gives peace, makes forgiveness possible, and allows us the joy of contentment. Amen.